Shall we go? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our April Albany Pine Bush Science Lecture. I'm Richard Naylor from the Friends of the Pine Bush Community, which co-sponsor with commissioned staff our monthly series. Before today's program, Moth Diversity on Fire Managed Barrens in the Albany Pine Bush, just a word about next month's science lecture. It's called Afterburn, the Ecological Response to the 2018 Altona Flat Rock Wildfire. In 2018, a wildfire burned 225 hectares, which in my reading is about four, over 400 acres of jack pine sandstone pavement barrens at the Altona Flat Rock in Northern New York. Not only is a wildfire disturbance of this scale uncommon in the Northeast, but jack pine is, like in the pine bush, largely dependent on stand replacing fire for its continued dominance and success, making this an ecologically important event. Starting immediately after the wildfire in fall of 2018, Dr. Danielle Garneau and Dr. Mark Lesser and their students began tracking the forest, wildlife, and insect community response and recovery from this disturbance. In this presentation next month, they will discuss the unique ecosystem that the Flat Rock represents and share results from their ongoing research uh, on post-disturbance response. So back to this evening though, if you have any questions, just use the Q&A option at the bottom of the screen. And unless it's uh, something where Dylan thinks we need to interrupt the speaker, we'll hold those to the end. And, uh, and that's always a nice section of the program also. So now back to Dylan to introduce today's speaker. Thank you so much, Richard, and thank you everyone so much for joining us this evening. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight, uh, Mark Mello, who's Director Emeritus at the Lloyd Center for the Environment. Um, so I think Mark is going to give a little bit of background in um, how he got into moths, but he has been doing insect surveys since the early 80s um, through a lot of contract work for um, the state. And he's worked primarily with moths, also dragonflies and damselflies. He did get a master's degree in zoology, but he's always done this informal insect work. And I'm looking forward not only to hear what uh, Mark has discovered in the pine bush in his survey in the pine bush, um, but also his story about how he's learned so much about moths. So thank you so much for joining us tonight, Mark. You're welcome. Are we ready to go? Yeah, you can go. take it away. Okay. Okay. Uh, I should say at the outset that this is preliminary uh, work in terms of the monitoring work that we've done for moths uh, in the Albany pine bush. Uh, the sampling was going to be once a month at uh, three sites, which is going to miss a lot of moths. Uh, we got involved with this uh, as part of a large project uh, that uh, the uh, Northeastern Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies uh, have uh, funded the Wildlife Institute. And I've been subcontracted to do a portion of this. Um, as you can see, um, there are sites from Maine to Maryland, basically looking at or uh, trying to determine if there's a optimal uh, management technique or management tools uh, that can be used uh, to maintain barrens uh, in basically the Northeast and Middle Atlantic states. Uh, my responsibility in both type there is uh, Massachusetts, Rhode Island and the Albany Pine Bush uh, in New York. I'll be talking a little about a little bit about all the sites that I was looking at this year, and then focusing down on the Albany Pine Bush. Uh, the Albany Pine Bush uh, is basically a uh, Barrens Heathlands mosaic that is maintained by fire. Uh, to get started, uh, why moths, why me, and why barons? 
Uh, why moths? Well, they make up 90% of the fourth largest order of uh, Lepidoptera. Uh, beetles win the prize for abundance, followed by the Hymenopterans, these wasp and ants, and the Dipterans, uh, flies, mosquitoes, and so forth. They're also a major prey for ne uh, neotropical migrants, particularly the larvae. If you sit and look at a nest of a passerine, a wobbler, bluebird or whatever, chances are that most of what he's going to be bringing to, or she's going to be bringing to the nest is going to be uh, moth larvae, a uh, nice fat moth larvae to give their young a good start, a good start in life. Um, age of pollinators, uh, bees get all the glory, but uh, flies, wasps, ants, and particularly moths and butterflies also are significant pollinators. Um, and then in terms of at least a legal, uh, uh, no, it's legally, uh, 37 species of moths list on the Massachusetts Endangered Species Act uh, have uh, legal protection um, and are regulated in the state. Um, and then, of course, there's always aesthetics. How I got involved in this as a little kid, I was given this, which my mother put in an aquarium, in which I completely, you know, ignored until one day uh, this hatched out of it. Cecropia moth, uh, one of our biggest, biggest silkworm moths. Most people, when they think of moths, they think of something that's around the order of some shade of gray or brown. But we have some spectacular moths. This Polyphemus, also a silk moth, uh, shares uh, the record with uh, the Cecropia as being uh, the largest moth, you know, that breeds in the Northeast. Uh, you can get up to a six and a half inch wingspan, especially big female. And they range down to the little tiny guys. This is barely three quarters of an inch long. It's got a wonderful common name. It's a psychedelic Jones moth. Um, and is a, maybe a Barron's uh, restricted thing. Um, it's not common. Um, I think for a lot of reasons is when it's over, it's overlooked until you get it under a magnifying glass and get a close look at it. At it. These are called the micro lips, uh, a micro lepidoptera. It's not a taxonomic division. But it's in general the smaller, more primitive moths. But some of the micros can be bigger, bigger than the macros. But because there's so many of these, so many of them that are undescribed, and so many of them you have to do genitalic dissection even to get a name on them. Uh, most of what we talked about and what we count up um, in this project were the macro moths. And some of them, like Melchina sackberry here, almost fit the uh, acronym of being sort of a cuddly, warm, and fuzzy, fuzzy creature. Uh, and of course, some like Luna Moth, just gorgeous. Now, in 1982 is when the Mass Massachusetts Endangered Species Act uh, was promulgated. And it uh, regulates a take, it protects habitat, as well as the individual animal itself, and this extends to private property. And I believe still to this day, this is the only states, a number of states have endangered species acts that protect land on public or protect uh, rare species on public land. But I believe Massachusetts is still the only state that protects uh, its rare species on private property. I should say regulate better than protects because the goal is not to buy up every piece of land that's got a rare species on it, but to regulate development in such a way that it's not going to significantly impact the existence of currently rare species. Um, I got involved early on, and that became most of my work on a golf course on Nantucket, uh, where the Barron's buck moth was the only rare species known on Nantucket, and it was a posed golf course going up in its habitat. Um, rare moths, I think we should talk about what's rarity. Um, in Massachusetts, that means it's native to and breeding in Massachusetts. Most other states that have an act have the same 
thing. It needs to be native and breeding. Then it occurs in limited or unique habitats, are globally rare, evidence of decline over time, um, habitat loss, or it's on the endangered species list. So most of the states would have some variation of this, um, and usually three categories, endangered, threatened, and special concern. Now, here's an example of a species that is um, globally rare. This is a uh, water willow borer, Papagena sulfurata, and this is its worldwide distribution, basically five counties in southeastern Mass. Um, it is relatively common in terms of you can go into almost, you know, any swamp with uh, water willow and you will find the species hard enough for it. Water willow was found throughout the state. In fact, it's found from Maine to Florida, but this species just occupies this little slip of the land. Uh, this species, on the other hand, is very rare. You rarely see it in Massachusetts, not common anywhere. It's a tropical and subtropical species really good flyer and occasionally gets up the Northeast. So even though we may find this here or there in Massachusetts, we would never consider listing it because it doesn't breed here, can't survive here. However, it gives this little uh, chunk down here means it's had an encounter with a bird that didn't quite get a good enough hold on it. Um, this species, Avagratus benjamini, is an example of a species that again has a narrow uh, and very habitat specific uh, distribution. Uh, but this is a uh, uh, world uh, sort of statewide map. This is for math, uh, moth producers, uh, moth producers, moth uh, photographers group. Um, uh, this mass moths is a map that's uh, been done in conjunction with uh, Steve Whitebread, Stephen Whitebread, who has actually produced all these wonderful uh, maps and is the organizer of the database. Um, Dan Zimbalin, who's a collector, and myself uh, have taken on a project or developed a project to basically map all the records for species in lots of Massachusetts. Um, this is an example where there's many more records for this species than you would see on here, which only has four records, only two in Massachusetts. Uh, so for Massachusetts, we've got a much more detailed distribution of the record of the species. Um, you can see it's basically right along the coast. And in fact, is a barrier dune species, which is another xeric habitat that we really are not addressing in this project. But it's another one that you find in xeric habitats. Uh, the larvae feeds on beach plum. Um, and these are areas, uh, pine barrens, where you have, for one reason or another, uh, beach, uh, uh, beach plum trees, uh, beach plum bushes surviving. Uh, this moth, which doesn't really have a common name, um, is found almost the exact same range as the previous, except it's further west occurs again along beach situations. These are probably the prairie or rivery distributions. And is also, at least in the Northeast, restricted to pitch pine. Um, so here's the map for, from uh, my photographer's group. And here's the one from Mass Moths. And you can see this is almost identical to the whoops, oh wait, to the distribution for uh, Avogratus benjamini. Uh, it has a little bit more dots on here, like one or two down here, and that's about it. It also feeds on beach plum, and so it's not a surprise that its distribution mirrors this other species. It also feeds on it. Um, 
So that's sort of a uh, quick uh, introduction to mapping and sort of getting historic records of these things. Um, one of the reasons that uh, Steve Whitebread had wanted to start this, and I had always been thinking about it, is that existing information really did not give you a good idea of the distribution um, of the species uh, so throughout the Northeast or even North America. Um, Massachusetts is probably more intense. You'll see as we go through more, um, New York seems to have no moths at all. And I know that's not the case, but they've never made it to moth photographers group. Um, some of them have made it to butterflies and moths of North America, some of them to iNaturalists, but I couldn't find one single place where they um, all were found uh, in New York. Now, why is Zurich habitats uh, so interesting to moths um, and so have so many rare species? And basically, there are rare habitats, scrub oak barrens and sand plain grasslands heathlands are globally rare habitats. So it's not surprising that species that are tied into those are going to be uh, considered rare as well. Maybe very common within the habitats. In fact, one of them regularly defoliates the barrens, but it's only in fire-maintained barrens, so say uh, rare species. Uh, also development, although barrens were not very good for farming, a lot of them were very good for development because they were dry and re relatively easy to develop. Um, fire suppression also lets uh, barrens uh, succeed uh, to mature dry forests. And so you lose a lot of the barrens, peatlands habitats. And then um, <clears throat> a host of early successional species, you know, that may be either affiliated or obligate to these barrens, going to be the last reason I got up here for why, why we're looking at barrens. Uh, now, this is a list from Rhode Island, New York, and Massachusetts. This is from New York's uh, Natural uh, Department of Environmental Con Conservation draft list of uh, rare species. Uh, they list six moths, four of which are uh, barren species. Rhode Island lists 15 moths, only six of which are barren species. Uh, Massachusetts has a list of 37 moths, 20, 21 of which are barren species. Um, and a lot of these, I don't know enough about New York, but my guess is a large number of these could end up being on a New York species list, depending on where they draw the line on what's where, and what isn't where. Um, we went through the criteria, but still it's human beings that are deciding, okay, at this level of uh, vulnerability, uh, we're considering it worth putting on the list. Okay, now on the Massachusetts Research, Massachusetts Endangered Species um, Act, um, it is indicated 21 species of barren species, nine species in wetlands, three species from sand plain grasslands, oh, it sort of overlaps the dunes, and three species in barrier dune, affiliated with barrier dunes, which also could have particularly in uh, end up on barrens in um, coastal habitats. And these others uh, are either poorly known or in case of the inchworm and the sallow um, uh, restricted by their host plant. Now, survey methods. Um, you need to carry a trap or the way we survey, and it's the most efficient way to survey, especially if you're doing limited number of surveys is you get a trap and you get a battery or a battery and you hoof out uh, hoof out to a barren situation. Turn the light on, let it run overnight at least from dawn to dusk, then open the trap, use oh and use ultraviolet light or uh, mercury vapor because that's the blue range of light. And that's the range of light that insects uh, respond to. 
they don't respond to the infrareds or yellows. Um, then you open the trap and you're first awed and amazed by the number of species, um, then horrified, realizing you've got to separate all these and count up each individual species. Um, right here, I should point out, this is on the New York's uh, list. This sample is not from New York, but this species here, uh, Herodias gerardi, um, uh, Gerard's underwing is one of the species on the New York list. It's a Pine Barrens uh, scrub oak specialist. Uh, so you sort your insects into piles and count them up and you have data. Okay, now we'll jump to the data that we accumulated this year and this year's project. Um, 228 species uh, from the Rhode Island Barrens, uh, which I should say at the outset, they've just started to restore this barrens. And the condition they're in is basically all the trees uh, cut down and everything mowed so that when we started out, there was essentially no vegetation growing on the, uh, on the landscape, but uh, quickly was coming in. Um, the purple line is Katema in uh, Martha's Vineyard. Orange, the uh, red line, uh, the Almany pine bush. And Nantucket was down here. So you can see the numbers at the end is how far, how many they were in each of these traps. Almost the same amount in uh, the um, Rhode Island Barrens is in the Albany pine bush, but a very different assemblage. Um, these are randomized curves. So I randomized the samples to get a cumulative curve of uh, new species per, per track. Um, as you see, most of these curves are still going up. This is an unusual artifact. And I resisted the temptation to just pick a new set of random numbers to get a nicer looking curve. I don't think 228 is the largest uh, or the largest, yeah, the largest number of moths that could be found in the site. Um, for instance, at the Lloyd Center, where I would trap um, twice a week uh, for the season, um, I would get between 350 and 450 species of moths uh, for a season. So this, these numbers are reflective um, more of the limited uh, field traps, the once a month uh, field season, uh, than some indication of the total diversity at the property. Um, now, to look at Albany pine bush, because one of the questions is, at least on management, you know, what effect is fire having on, on this place? So, the fire management techniques that we're using. Um, and uh, it's difficult to say from these from the examples. This, before we get to that, I actually should add, this is a, a graph of the number of species that all only showed up in one station, it's 120. The number that showed up in two stations, 74. And the number that showed up in all three stations was nine. And this is a curve that you would expect um, there's a lot more to be found. Um, basically, a, a curve that if you've had a you know infinite number of samples, you would probably in the same habitat, you would get a curve that would start like this, then probably go up, then whoops. Probably go go up, then come down, then start to go up again and plateau at some maximum number where you're just not getting much or just a few samples, you know, new individuals per sample. Hey, for instance, again, at the Lloyd Center where I worked, um, we ran traps from 1983 until uh, 2012. And even at 2012, I was getting one or two new species a year. And we were up to 700 of the macro, macro species. Um, micros, you'd expect to see this be the same amount, which means just from one trap at one site at one place, I was uh, 
probably having uh, 1,400 species of moths moth residing there. Okay, now, in terms of what's on the New York, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts state list, I brought up no species that were on the Nantucket list, bird endangered, although they did, they did show up some other stations. Only one on the Rhode Island list and 10 on the Massachusetts list. Um, part of this is the number of samples and when they were taken. Moth's lifetime as an adult is usually maybe two to three weeks. And if you're doing a sample every four weeks, you could miss an entire uh, flight period of some moths. And the second thing is that um, Massachusetts, particularly Nantucket and uh, Martha's Vineyard, we were sampling in some of the richest uh, habitats uh, for rare species in the state. So it's not surprising to come up uh, with a number of species that we did come up with, even with a limited amount of sample. Um, now, I came up with a different kind of list. I came up with a list that's what I think is species that are affiliated uh, with barrens, um, barrens, heathlands. Um, <clears throat> just to get a bigger list, because the state was particularly in New York is so small, you, you know, it's easy to miss. And only four species were barren species that were on that list. So I came up with another one. This particular bug here, Apotropanulactrix, the New Jersey tea worm, um, we only have three records in the state of Massachusetts. Um, that a moth photographer's group, and uh, moths and butterflies in North America website show no uh, examples of this species from New York. That I don't think that can be right. In fact, I know Neil Shopperman, who's part of this project, had picked up this previously. But of course, if it doesn't get uh, recorded to a site, then it doesn't show up in print. Um, so I wanted to get to make this list as you know, I didn't want to exaggerate this list, but I did want to have a list of what are at least Barron's uh, affiliates. Oops. And if we do that, uh, we come up with uh, looking at the number of species. We got four species from New York, three from Rhode Island, eight from Katama. Again, Katama is, that's just mother load at Habitat, and four from Nantucket. Um, gives us a few more species uh, to work with. Um, we can look at the distribution uh, in New York. We're interested in this project focusing on uh, New York. Um, okay. The species I was just talking about earlier, Epodromanulactric the Boraria, the New Jersey tea worm. Uh, this is the distribution in Massachusetts. It shows basically in the Connecticut uh, River Valley watershed. These are New Jersey tea, and this is a plant that is getting hammered by deer brown. Um, in lots of areas where you just got this almost carpet of uh, this shrub, which gets to be 10, 12 feet tall, but it's like eight inches tall. It's just been browsed down and in some places browsed out of existence. So the moth has been declining. Um, now this distribution shows essentially some, most of the Massachusetts records shows that it's still got a scattering out here in um, the Midwest, but Again, New York, no New York representatives, but I know that's not the case. Unfortunately, I didn't have time. I thought at the last minute, uh, McCabe, Tim McCabe does a lot. She's with the New York His Natural History Museum, and I'm sure he has a pretty extensive list of moths from New York. But unfortunately, I thought about that just a little too late, about three o'clock this afternoon, to make use of that information. Um, 
this species, which is only described about uh, 10 years ago, uh, the Pine Barrens Speranza, this is an example of a species that had been collected by quite a few collectors and quite a few museums and just nobody ever got around to putting a name on it. So it was not new to science, but his name is new to science. And it has a pretty good distribution in Massachusetts in the Plymouth um, Pine Barrens and at Camp Edwards on Cape Cod. Um, very Zurich Barrens and in uh, Mount Tokoa out here, which um, basically is a very dry, rocky, uh, pitch pine, scrub oak, uh, bald mountain, essentially, that had a fire go through. And this thing is very fire uh, affiliated. This just odd distribution out here is Camp Curtis Dill. And there's a lot of burning that goes on out there. And although it doesn't have a lot of what I would call barren's habitat, the moth showed up. You know, how it all of a sudden shows up in a burned area after not finding it wherever is a good question, but it does. And a couple of other species do the same, the same thing. They manage, manage to find their habitat, even if they seem to be uh, widely, just, you know, widely distributed previously. Um, this is the states, this is the, uh, should say the worldwide distribution, as far as you know, of the species. Uh, an odd one in Virginia here, but basically uh, the center of the distribution is in New Jersey and Southeast Massachusetts. So this is certainly a globally rare species for as far as moth uh, distribution go. Uh, this uh, Pine Barrens, Sanclagnatha, there are no official common names. So that I think when people get tired, they just use the genus name as the end of the first name that they want to give the species. Um, this one is a pitch pine feeder as a larva, and it has a fairly widespread range, but is tied in strictly to pitch pine. And even so, and it's a dead, dead leaf feeder, it feeds on dead some live pitch pine, also dead pitch pine and dead scrub oak leaves. Um, out on Cape Cod and the islands where there is certainly a ton of pitch pine, it does not seem to occur. Um, it seems to occur in inland barrens in both Massachusetts, also fairly regularly in Rhode Island. Um, it's one that you know is affiliated, but it doesn't need really good barrens. This barrens, this is in Concord, Mass, and this barrens is mere, basically an acre. And still, moth survives. Um, okay, and this is the distribution of uh, at the Pine Barrens, Anklin, Napa. Um, scattered out here and uh, seems to have a distribution here in the uh, Tennessee. So this would be the Smoky Mountains and maybe the Piedmont. Um, and then through Maryland, New Jersey, Massachusetts and uh, along the coast of Maine and New Hampshire. Um, it's another one that, you know, it's affiliated, but it's not as tight. I certainly wouldn't call it an obligate species, but an affiliate species. Um, Zali uh, submediana, does nobody has put a common name on it, on it yet. Um, this has a fairly spotty but wide distribution. It's also a pitch pine theme. And in Massachusetts, um, it's mostly been found in southeast of Mass, Plymouth County, and again, Camp Edwards area. Camp Edwards is about 28,000 acres. It's a training site and also includes Otis Air Force Base. And they've had wildfires from shooting ammunition. They've done a number of things completely not considering the moths, but have created and maintained actually ideal habitat. Uh, for our rare moths. Um, it seems to have reduced uh, distribution. All these on the Cape, 
are pre-2000 records. And this is a case, though, where I don't think anybody's been out there uh, collecting to document. They're still there. Another problem, another problem with sightings is that um, there's too many of them and not enough of us in terms of trying to keep up uh, with their population. Now, this one is not um, listed, and it might not be a Pine Barrens affiliate, but I added it in here because it's the first time I found it. You know, I found a lot of them at uh, basically uh, mostly at uh, Alley Cat and uh, site at the Albany Pine Bush. Um, it has a pretty wide distribution in the Midwest, has one location, one record in Massachusetts, uh, one in Connecticut, and then that's it for New England and New York. And that may be a uh, misnomer. Um, it is a larva feeds on big blue stem grass. Um, and big blue stem grass, let's see. Is uh, there's our one record in Massachusetts is uh, abundant in uh, the um, the Pine Barrens, particularly at Alley Cat and Bivy, and areas that are being fire maintained. So it's not surprising that it had a good distribution in those two sites. Um, now we'll talk about fire management and a little bit more about uh, specifically the uh, <coughs> the uh, Albany Pine Bush. Um, this is pretty much what it looks like in early spring without a burn. Uh, this is the morning after a burn. It just happened to be the night that I was uh, sampling the bugs. So it burns the top layer in pretty good shape. But this is in August of the same area. So basically, it does not seem to kill many or most of the shrubs, and, but still opens up habitat. The plants come here. If you didn't see sort of the telltale, tell, telltale dead branches and so forth, um, and still maybe be able to see some of the ground that's still blackened, uh, you wouldn't even know they had a fire in the spring. So this does keep it open, and regular fires will uh, eventually at least reduce and not completely get rid of the shrubbery, but it allows a lot of forbs to come to come through. Um, Anything else I want to say about that? Uh, uh, oh, yeah, this is again, here's the big blue stem grass here coming up. Well, I had no idea that this was here when I was here in uh, May. <coughs> and here it is all, all the place in August. Um, now, this is. Uh, Okay, now we're looking at the individuals uh, trapped after the burn by month. The blue is going to be Alley Cat, the orange is Bivy, and these are the two sites that were burned. Green Taxes is a control site, and that has not been burned. And so this site is anything from, I would say, waste to a little bit over head high scrub oak dominant in this area. Um, they started out not that far apart the day. This is literally the day after the burn, you know, and here at uh, Alley Cat, we had about 70, 74 individuals uh, in the trap, um, 50 at the control and about 25, a little over 25, I think, at Bivy. Uh, by June, about the same amount in the two burn sites. Uh, many more in the green taxes site, 150 individuals. By July, the number of individuals crashed down to 50. Meanwhile, both the burn sites are increasing. And by August, uh, Alley Cat really peaked. Then uh, there's a peak in uh, Bivy as well. There's a slight peak for August here, but basically much, much lower than these sites. This is 125 individuals, I'm sorry, uh, roughly 65 individuals. This was about 140 and 350 individuals 
at Alley Cat. And then in September, they all came significantly downward, which you would expect at the end of the, towards the end of the season, with Alley Cat still being uh, the dominant one. Now, the way the traps are placed after the burn, you have sort of a clear vision of the light shining because you don't have anything higher than the light is. Whereas in Green Texas, where you're in a scrub oak area, although the trap was set in a clearing within the scrub oak, um, that's probably not as great of a uh, draw as there is in these sites, particularly when it comes to numbers of individuals. But now looking at number of species, we've got the first two months kind of show the same, you know, it's somewhere between 20 and just over 30 species for the three sites. They're pretty close together now in the June sample, unlike uh, the numbers, which are much higher for the control. Then the numbers of species keep increasing in July and August, where they're decreasing or basically flat for the control site and then dropping down in September, but still with a larger number of species. Uh, this may be more significant. Um, and to me, what, what this says to me, and again, this is preliminary and next year might tell me something totally different, but just looking at this, it says it looks like, okay, you probably burned up a bunch of species early on here. Um, you're roughly anywhere between 200 to 500 uh, meters from unburned habitat and sort of a source, you know, population where you haven't burned. So these can come back in and you've got all sorts of new vegetation which may be an attractant for females to come in and be laying their eggs on new foliage and uh, the plants that may have been hard to find, you know, in a in green taxes. They may, they may have been either swamped out or hidden by the scrub oak. Um, and they're, so they're taken off in July and August and then coming down as you expect all of them to uh, in September. It also tells me, you know, since we didn't have data here before, um, we really can't say what the change is from the unburned to the burned portion. But over time, one could. Now these, the Barron's affiliates and their host plants, uh, I just set up this, I, what they were feeding on. This is the same list. Uh, we saw earlier, except this is um, for all Barron's affiliates. So I put this together to take a look at um, the number of affiliates that could be based on host plants at uh, the Albany Pine Bush and how many were actually there. Um, I'm not sure I can draw much conclusions from it right now, but I thought it might be interesting. Um, a lot. Uh, not, nine of the species are primarily a low bush blueberry. These nine species are primarily a low bush blueberry feed. And of them, even though there's a lot of low bush blueberry in all three habitats, less so at green taxes, there's only two species of the blueberry feeding species showed up uh, that we call a barren's affiliate. Um, none of the ones whose main food plant is bayberry, but also may feed on other plants. None of those showed up. Uh, the oak species, there's 10 species on those uh, these Barron's affiliates uh, that showed up uh, during the study that feed on scrub oak. Um, the species, we saw the picture earlier on this, uh, is actually the highest number of species that showed up. Um, and uh, Fabi Gattata had the second highest, but only three, three of the 10 oak feeders uh, showed up. And um, I should say this list that I put together, these species were found um, in some cases 
on other sites other than um, the Pine Bush site, um, or occasionally not at all. This is just a list I came up with. Uh, somebody might come up with a different set of 58, you know, or more or less. Um, so like I say, don't take this as that these are the Barons affiliates. These are just the Barons affiliates in my experience uh, that have an affiliation uh, with Barons. So in comparison, <coughs> between the uh, four sites that I sampled at, 15% um, of the species, 20 species of affiliates were found on Nantucket. 25% uh, the Katamer, again, we mentioned earlier how the Katamer was, uh, which is 13%. Um, and Pine Barrens affiliates, 20, 17 species showed up, um, which is 8%. So we got a pretty good drop there. Um, and at Nicholas and Pratt Farms, only 10 species. There's only 4% of the total species there. And as I had mentioned, that isn't the way to becoming barons and hasn't quite got there. It was barons historically, but it grown up in the pitch pine, white pine, and oak woodland. Um, so the trees were taken down uh, and everything brush hogged. So you basically got bare ground with a lot of leaf litter on the ground. Not, not what you can use with barons. Whether they'll burn there, I don't know, but they're an example of mowing. Uh, okay, so summary of barons uh, at the Albany pine bush between alley cat, bivy, and green taxes. Again, these are the two burn station, and this is the control station. Um, <coughs> whoops, no. Uh, the Albany pine bush, this Macaria exonerata, showed up at Bivy, but most of them are at green taxes, which is a station that is not burned. Although, you know, I'd have to defer to Dylan. I suspect it was burned uh, or at least mowed at some point in its history. Um, but there you have it. That's where they were. Um, by Colorado, just a few, a little bit more at Bivy, even though this is a pitch pine feeder. Um, uh, Tacpari, only one you can't say much about when just one species shows up. Io moth, I should say something, that's one of the silkworm moths that's clearly in a decline. That moth was everywhere and feed it practically on everything, it fed on corn. Um, but basically, if it had its brothers, it likes uh, things in the cherry rose family. Um, so it's still existent in the burn areas at Alley Cat and Bivy. And again, it's relatively common on Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, and but has disappeared from most of the rest of Massachusetts. Same story with this. It was only one individual that showed up, and I don't have its location. Oops, I missed putting a number in. And I'm not just going to stick one in there. I know we found it, but I'm not just going to stick it in now. because <laughs> It'll be wrong wherever I put it. Um, but this species, again, was abundant, fed on uh, cherry, apple, roses. I mean, it was a pest species, basically, in gardens, in suburban gardens. Um, and it has just crashed in Massachusetts. Um, one did show up somewhere here at uh, uh, the Albany Pine Barrens. Aurora also. Uh, Found the small numbers at Alley Cat. Um, the sweet fern underwing, sweet fern was another plant that we found at all three sites, uh, and it was most common at the burn site. Uh, Hypostrodia is a small, small uh, gray moth. Actually, you would think it was a micro, it's so small. Uh, most showed up at uh, Alley Cat and Bivy. Um, Triton. Uh, we got one, one or two individuals. Meropleon, that showed up uh, mostly at Alicat and Green Texas. Um, Stigmosa, mostly at Bivy. So these are small, small numbers, but you know, a significant number of affiliates showed up at the burn sites. Both species at Alicat, 11 at Bivy, uh, as opposed to seven species 
at Green Taxis. Green Taxis had the most, uh, thanks mostly to uh, the Macari Exonerata. Um, but it indicate to me that, again, this indicates that uh, the uh, bird sites, even the first year after a burn, are doing better than the control sites. Well, it's very interesting that it's see what happens next year. My prediction is this will go great guns next year, but we'll have to see. Now, conclusions on this. Barons and Heathlands support a diverse as well as specialized moth fauna. Again, we're just seeing a small slice, small slice with only five uh, sample dates, you know, a month apart throughout the season. Um, and we certainly had a number of specialized moths show up in that, as well as some general general moths. The, uh, the European cutworm, which is London everywhere and everybody's garden and show up, uh, loves pine barrens. I think, again, it's a nice early succession thing for them. Um, the 2021 survey has undersampled the moth fauna at all in pine bush. Uh, we've talked about that enough. Uh, the moth fauna includes obligates and affiliates, as well as a generally distributed situation. The uh, okay, the species. Uh, the Speranza is clearly one of the obligate species uh, in a, in a pine barrens. Um, just for example. Uh, threats to xeric habitats in general are development, mismanagement, um, habitats, habitat mismanagement, and plant succession. So this is to some degree what the uh, whole project, you know, the Northeast Wide Project, is attempting to get a handle on. They're trying to get a handle on uh, both, well, the funding is for looking at pollinators, I mean, we've looked at a whole you know, host of different, different groups of animals. Um, so the first five years, pollinators was the focus. I mean, these were the focus of this project. Um, in year five, which was last year, um, they decided that moths should be added to the list. I don't know if butterflies are being looked at or not, because um, they're certainly pollinators as well. <clears throat> they may have been interested in moths because they're just so many more moths uh, than the butterflies in terms of get a larger database. Uh, and then they got to go through and sort of so sort out the moths that don't have moth parts, those that don't really nectar, but take sap, rotting fruit. But I digress, you know, areas are being burned, and managed in different ways. They're being burned, they're being mowed. You know, there's, I don't think there's any coordination. There's discussion, but not coordination between state and state on how habitat are being managed. Uh, two main ones, though, a fire and mowing, some combination. All of this project is try to see if there's a overarching management technique or maybe a technique that's on a clinal, maybe what works in the northern part of the range, work in the southern part of the range. So they want to try to get a handle on that by looking at range wide um, Zurich, Zurich habitat. And finally, fire management at Albany appears to be supporting at least two obligate species the apple granulacris, that was the other one, the New Jersey, New Jersey tea worm. And Speranza externata. Those had enough individuals present in the traps, that, including females, so that they have been clearly breeding um, in these habitats.
Um, first, I'm going to di digress a little bit. <clears throat> Hector John, St. John de Quavassier was a uh, late 1700s uh, naturalist who visited Nantucket. In fact, this is an example of probably he walked across this head of the plains, which is uh, one of the areas that we sampled at it, Nantucket. And his opinion of this was this island furnishes the naturalist with few or no objects worthy of observation. It appears to be the uneven summit of a sandy submarine mountain covered here and there with sorrel, grass, a few cedar bushes, and scrubby oaks. Um, I'm not sure what kind, he certainly wasn't a birder, but he certainly wasn't an entomologist and probably not a botanist. So I'm not, well, actually, I think I do know. Naturalists at that time, many of them were looking for plants that could be either eaten or used in construction. Uh, my guess is that's where he was coming from in this, because this is Nantucket, the heart of rare species, both plants and insects have it. Uh, for Massachusetts moths, uh, the reinversions of uh, basically uh, field surveying, the heyday of CVIPs alone, field surveying in Massachusetts was really from the uh, late 1880s to about the 1940s. There, you know, there was num numerous uh, uh, Lepidopterists going out and doing surveys in Massachusetts. Then it kind of died out. Um, but for example, by 1883, these fellows uh, identified 387 species of moths for Massachusetts. Farquhar basically did his PhD thesis on moths of New England. And in that publication, he identified 1,580 species in Massachusetts. Kimball and Jones wrote the Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, uh, Moths and Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket. They identified just from those two islands, 1,383 species. Our Mass Moths Project, Danny Zimbalin and I, with lots of help from other uh, lepidopterists in Massachusetts, a lot of photographers, uh, Murray being uh, one of the uh, prime ones um, have come up to 2000, Massachusetts numbers now have come up to 2,900 species in Massachusetts. Um, I am sure once all the micro moths have been identified, we're going to be over 3,000 species in Massachusetts. Um, Connecticut has slightly over 3,000 species. Again, I have no idea about New York. Somebody must have a list somewhere, maybe in their back pocket. Um, but in Rhode Island, probably has a list that's somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500. But this is very intense. And so we have a pretty good idea in Massachusetts of what the distribution of moths are for at least the macro species. The micros, again, it really no, nowhere near the numbers have been collected than of a collective of macros, and there's just not enough taxonomists for all the groups to get names on all the groups. Here's an example of uh, another micro moth. This is in the family Tortricidae, which are leaf rollers, caterpillars are leaf rollers and leaf miners. Um, I got several of these at Alley Cat, and I think maybe one at Green Taxis. Um, this one did not have a name on it, and not only did it not have a name, this one had never been seen before. This is literally a new bug to science. Like I had mentioned earlier, there's a lot of undescribed species in collections that no one's got around to. This one, as far as uh, Michael Sabaron knows, and he's the expert, the reigning expert in this area on the Tordricity, and he's doing a manuscript of this and other uh, moths in that family. Um, as far as he knows, this is the first of these that have ever been collected. And he says this is a well, relatively well-known group uh, of microbes. He was pretty amazed by that. Pretty neat. Now, 
nice but ever figure out what a soul sign is and you turn up things that you never expected to see this monster is a mole cricket um i've only seen one speak one before in my life and i never knew they could fly this ended up in the bucket in the light craft the only way it could get in there is by flying and sure enough there's there's his wings um, this spends most of his life underground. It's probably nowhere near as rare as it seems, but um, it just probably doesn't come out that often. Um, you know, it's interesting that it was found in the trap the day after the fire. So it probably got a little disturbed, it got a little warm down there, and he decided to come out and take a look around. Um, so it's just fun being out, out in Barrens. Um, I need to acknowledge the Wildlife Institute, who contracted me to do the Massachusetts Island and New York work. Um, the Northeast Alliance of Fish and Wildlife Seas, who provided the funding for this project. Nantucket Conservation, Linda Loring Foundation, and the Nature Conservancy and Rhode Island, Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management for permits and permission to do this on their park. I'd like to thank Steve, uh, uh, white bread uh, for being the impetus for this project and providing those uh, wonderful Massachusetts moths and moth photographers group for and I guess on that note I'd be really ready to entertain questions wow that's it's just so much information <laughs> thank you so much mark um can you scroll back to that new species that's exciting which which site did you get that in that was uh i believe alley cat and i think there was one at green taxes but i know they were at alley cat so um, do you do you get to name it because you found it no but it may be named after my spouse it might be the genus is pelochristia it might be Hello, Christia Roguskii. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> wow. I'll pass that's... that around because that's not official yet. It hasn't been published. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't hear it here from me. <laughs> that is so exciting. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yes, wow. Um, so yeah, everybody, if you have any questions, feel free to put them into the Q&A. Um, Richard did have a question early on. He said um, on the sheet where you're showing the endangered species by state, he was surprised that there was not much overlap. Um, and he's wondering why you think that might be. Let's see, that was over here? Yeah, I think that These are one. the ones yeah. that were found rather than the whole list. Are you talking about... Uh, the list itself or the number of rare, uh, listed species that were found on their list? I think he was, I think he asked it when it was the full list. Richard, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, it was the full list. Uh, okay, that, right here. Um, well, this this is came right off uh, their website. It's a giraffe species list. Um, and this is what they had on the list. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't know enough about what's going on uh in new york with these species you know uh maybe some of the species that are rare in massachusetts have a much broader distribution in new york and i just wasn't able to get a hold of um you know a moth distribution group i know this more because i i went through everything in the smithsonian collection to get massachusetts records and it seemed there was always new york and a ton of bugs and then uh few in Massachusetts and maybe one from Rhode Island. <laughs> so I know that the, the moth photographers group is not accurate. So you can't go by that at all. Or was, the, was there another list? Because I there do was see- the, There's the um, Butterflies and Moths, B.A. Mona, Butterflies and Moths of North America has lists by county. But again, the lists are very, they're more than what's on Moth Photographers Group in New York, but they're still, you know, way below the numbers that would be found in it, in each of those counties. So I the list is, you know. I don't think that's the list I was looking, uh, the slide I was looking at, because um, I do see over, overlaps here. Yeah, I see them there. The 
Which Hala one? Grotus Benjamini is on oh, the yeah, next Benjamin. one as well. Yeah. Was there another? I'm sure list? it's in New York. I'm sure it's on Long Island. Um, if you've got dunes, if you got dunes and beach plum on Long Island, you're going to have that that bug. Uh, the person to us would be uh, Tim McCabe, whoops, who's a curator at the New York Museum of Natural History. Um, he he would know if there's a list that, um, like I say, I'm sorry that I was kicking myself at three o'clock this afternoon. I'm looking at looking at this and going, this is well, not this list, but this is what's published. But um, in terms of uh, a full list of moths in New York. Um, I know it's underrepresented. I don't know enough about what's going on with the list of New York. Um, like I said, this was a draft list. I don't know if they're accepting input um, for the list and not knowing the distribution of moths in New York. Uh, you know, I don't have much that I can add for that state. But I Thank would you. not be surprised if the lion's share of these in Massachusetts Belong, belong on the New York list. Um, so I did, when you sent me your list, Mark, I went, I went through it um, and I, I was surprised some of the ones that you found when I looked, I saw that they were regional species of conservation need or they were species that were listed in adjacent states. So I was surprised that they were not listed in New York state. And so I did ask Matt Schlesinger who works um, with the natural heritage program mm -hmm. about that. Um, and some of those species they are aware of, um, um, some of them, if they, when they redid the state wildlife action plan, you know, they had a bunch of state experts come in and provide input on these species. And if mm -hmm. some of them hadn't been documented in a long time, they were listed as extirpated and extirpated mm -hmm. species were taken off of the list. Mm -hmm. So, and I think there's some that they just didn't know whether or not we had them or yep. not. So I think the New Jersey inchworm, New Jersey tea inchworm mm -hmm. is a good example. Mm -hmm. So I suspect that our list will look very different when we, uh, <laughs> when we redo our state wildlife action plan. Well, the lists are very different on, I don't know how New York will handle it, but in Massachusetts, the state wildlife plan um, does have more moths than this on it. The Rhode Island State Wildlife Plan has every other moth listed <laughs> practically on the list. They listed almost everything. Um, no, that's an exaggeration, but they listed, they have well over 100 moths on their list. Um, like I say, and I would expect the New York State's Action Plan has more list than that, but the State Action Plan is not the same thing as the State you know, Endangered Species Plan. Um, and I don't know if New York would try to resolve that. There's no reason why it couldn't be the same as. Yeah, no, I mean, um, I think I think there's a move to try and uh, mm -hmm. not not be isolated with the state listings for species and try mm -hmm. and look at them more regionally. So, oh. um, you know, hopefully that'll be incorporated into our next plan. Um, but uh, let's see, um, Kim said, thank you so much, Mark. This is great. Uh, is DNA analysis done on specimens as well as morphologic features, morphological features to identify oh, species? For the micros, a lot of groups, that's how you have to identify them. That's how that one was addressed. He kept the type species, he was to say, um, and did genitalic section to you know, confirm that that was in fact you know, nothing Apparently had wildly different genitalia, so that it clearly was another in that group. Um, but yeah, use this list. Make sure that uh, you have the list. Now, do you do you have the list of all the species that uh, I documented? Yeah, did I send you? I did. Yeah, good. Yep. Sorry, yeah, I and I kind of I. Yeah. I put that up against what Neil Shopman found with mm -hmm. his survey that he did for his master's degree. Yeah. So there were some that you got, he didn't, and some that he got that you didn't. So uh, sure. I'm gonna put it all together. And yes, <laughs> um, Tim McCabe does have uh, an extensive list from, mm -hmm. he did a pretty extensive survey of the pine bush in the eighties. And he also mm -hmm. lives adjacent to the pine bush. So he's surveying regularly also. Neil is? 
or um, no, uh, Tim McCabe. Oh, That's Tim McCabe, McCabe. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. probably has the longest list <laughs> yeah. for, the, for the pine barrens. Yeah, but um, sure. you know, and that's something you know. I didn't get contracted to really do any report write up on this. You know, give my opinions, which is sort of what I've done here. Um, but certainly, Elizabeth needs to be aware of all these existing lists because it would be nice to have a composite list, regardless how old they are, of all the species that have been imported in the state, particularly in the pine barrens, since, you know, it's highly managed, it seems to be successfully managed, neighbors seem to be happy, even though you're burning right up <laughs> to their backyards, uh, so it seems to be a great, a great fit, and, and, and of course, it's worked fantastically for the kind of blue. Yes, that is that is one left that seems to be doing well. <laughs> um, so I had a I had a question for you. Is um, so you reference a lot of different sites for these species lists. Is there something that we can do or we should be doing? Um, and I don't mean the pine bush. I mean I guess entomologists and researchers to try and put this information all in one spot. And do you have an idea of what that spot would be so that? you know, we had, everybody had access to this information, these lists and such. Somebody who has a knowledge of sort of websites and working with websites and data and has a passion for moths. I mean, so long as it gets up on the website, then anybody in the world is going to be able to use it. It's like the massmoths.org. Mass I'll pull that up. That's where those came from. And it's Basically, it's got a, a complete county list, and then you can search on any individual species, get some you know, fragmentary information about it, but an up-to-date map distribution. It's not a uh, identification list, although there are pictures of the individuals. Also, and we will eventually get pictures of all the individuals, but it's not, it's not meant to be an identification. Right. That seems like it's something that would be very much worth it to try and centralize that information so that it was available to everyone. Because there were definitely species that you mentioned that um, I think was it the 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 nationwide maps that you put up that was yeah. for that was but that's um, moth yeah that's moth photographers moth photographers group because yeah. they definitely are missing some like some of the species I know are in New York so. Yeah. Um, I mean, all the common things are missing, you know, that are found from, you know, Massachusetts is black with dust, <laughs> all of a sudden it's <laughs> up on the New York border. And same way with Connecticut, uh, Dave Wagner really hasn't put a lot of this stuff up on Moth um, Group. Okay. So, yeah, but Maryland has put a lot of stuff. I think Maryland has put most of this on Moth because you'll find stuff that I think is fairly rare than all of a sudden. You see a few dots up here and a few dots down there, and Maryland is black with dots. So they're putting their information. I mean, for Steve Whitebread and I, it's really a labor of love. I have happened to have the tons and tons of data because I've been recording and identifying since the late 70s. So I got a lot of information, and we paid, uh, we, neither of us know how to make websites we paid it wasn't bad with three thousand dollars to get our mass moss website made and he's willing at least now you know to do the data manipulation on it but we've sort of paid paid for things unfortunately you know we looked around and said there's anybody that would fund this we didn't get any any nibbles mm. you know you know it may be something that uh, you know, natural heritage would, would pick up, you know, it's hard to say. Yeah. It, yeah. Or even like the pine bush, maybe somebody will come in there that loves moths at some, some time and say, hey, if you want to use our name and write a grant. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you need the person who's willing to deal with all the information and has to be. But it could be a private individual. You know, anybody that uh, 
well, not anybody. They need to know something about Mars, but um, it can be a private uh, citizen, but it needs to be somebody who's willing to put it together and put it up on the website. Yeah. It's a lot of work, I'm sure. And then various um, moths that are experts, very spooks can tell you whether you're crazy or not, so what you say is where. <laughs> Um, I was curious. So you mentioned a study that you did from, I think you said it was from like 1983 to, to 2000, was it 2012? Oh yeah. Where I worked at the Lloyd Center. Yeah. And so I was surprised that um, you said even after all that time in 2012, you were still finding new species. Yep. And so I was, I was kind of curious, you know, that seems I'm, I'm, you know, I'm cautiously optimistic there because there's been a lot of talk lately about um, just global insect declines, right? And mm -hmm. I wonder what, how you think that fits into that narrative. Uh, I'd like to do some more of that same sampling again because, well, I still may get no more. Part of it is global warming. We have new species coming into the state that either might have been, you know, in Massachusetts as a stray or are now breeding. I mean, we got examples of butterflies, the Sabalon skipper, um, giant swallowtails. They breed in Massachusetts now, and they used to be just strays. You know, and there's a little inchworm moth. Now I, I got close to the first record of this thing. Um, and it's now throughout Massachusetts. It's, I found the first record of the uh, European garden cutworm, which is a big, brown and uh, yellow banded, uh, black banded white moth. You can't mistake for anything, but I had no idea what it was when it came out of the trap because I don't know European European moths. Um, and I got the first record in um, Truro. I got two of them. The next year, I also got it back at the Lloyd Center in, in Dartmouth. And the third year, I got it everywhere I trapped. Oh, wow. You know, mm -hmm. so you've got invasive you know, invasive species coming over from Europe. Um, and we're in the mountains. I mean, up in uh, Franklin and northern Berkshire County, we're probably going to lose moths there over the wall. Mm. Um, things that are generally found up, you know, up in the mountains here and into Canada and are at their low, low range in Massachusetts. And... Um, some of the big, this uh, issue with spinches and some of the big silkworms, I just touched on it, that um, they seem to be disappearing from large areas of the state. And it seems to be more than just um, development. A collector in Connecticut, uh, Ben Williams, who's connected, you know, this house out in the boonies for 50 plus years, the habitat has not changed a bit. It's mature woodland around his house, but he's seen all these senses and the silkworms just drop out. He just doesn't get these anymore. Um, and the ash borer is nailing the ash, and there's a lot of senses that feed on ash. So hmm. there goes the host plant, there goes the bug. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, what um, <laughs> are there theories about what these declines are caused by? Uh, light appears to be a big one. Um, and it certainly can explain in developed areas. I don't know how that um, can count for undeveloped areas being uh, affected. Now, on like Montesvina and Nantucket, you know, these rare things, these silkworms are still going great guns. Uh, same thing out in the Berkshire, parts of the Berkshire County is the same way. But there's certainly plenty of other areas, you know, in the center of the state um, that are still seem to be losing these large moths. So it's not clear, and it may not be just one thing, but yeah. light, certainly where there is a lot of light, that's having a major effect. I even got to witness that to some degree. Um, I w worked at this ice cream place uh, in the local town, Dartmouth. When they move to a new location and they turn it into a restaurant as well as an ice cream place, had a giant parking lot, you know, big lights all over the place. You know, there were luna moths all over the parking lot. You know, they finally banned the 
of being the one to go out and pick up the trash in the parking lot. This was like a piece of trash, a Luna ball, a piece of trash, a Luna ball. Oh my gosh. You know, and after about five or six years ago, they didn't just see anything at the lights. And there was no other development going on around the property. So basically the lights just vacuumed up, you know, these big moths. Some of some moths are not really attracted or detracted by light, so not affected, but silkworms seem to be super affected by light. Hmm. You know, so that certainly could be a big reason for them at least. So what does the light do? They just get attracted to it and then they- uh yeah, disrupts disrupts their biology, basically. They get stuck by a light. No, they get then they get eaten by a bat or they fall to the ground and get eaten by a frog. And, you know, it's, you know, you'll see the uh, frogs and toads around lights often at the base base of lights waiting for their prey. Now you say that the moths are really only attracted to blue light or the blue blue spectrum. range, yeah, yeah. yeah they so see in the if, ultraviolet range. So if we changed our lights to yellows and reds, yellows would that and reds. Help? That's what uh, all the like ice cream places. What we did, we changed all our lights to yellow lights when they worked worked out. That, that's interesting. Uh, we put yellow lights in so that mosquitoes won't come to our doors. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, how how, uh, uh, how do uh, moths reproduce in terms of numbers? Um, I was thinking about the evolution of them. Uh, there's so many factors in in uh, in in evolution and survival and ecology. The light is one I hadn't thought of, but I, I know I've read about it. Mm-hmm. But if there was a huge turnover, if they if they reproduce really quickly, then perhaps some of them will adapt to like being off time where plants are ready, but they're not. So we have mm-hmm. that loop in here. As the as the as the temperature is different, the plants may bloom earlier, mm-hmm. but then the butterflies aren't there. So if, if the, if the uh, insect reproduces really quickly, like, like the, uh, the flies that they study, where they study them just because they, they change so fast and they can study mm-hmm. generations, right. that might help. That's a positive, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, what was I? The initial question I missed, but um, I was thinking in terms of adaptation, of, oh, you had asked, um, They lay a lot of eggs, basically, and uh, most of them do. And those that lay relatively few eggs sort of have specialized behavior laying eggs of the caterpillars sort of have specialized behavior for not getting eaten or they taste bad. Um, But they lay, most of them lay a lot of eggs from hundreds to a thousand, a thousand eggs. Uh, It's not a butterfly. I'm not a moth, but a butterfly. The regal fritillary lays over a thousand eggs, but she just sort of scatters them in the fall. The young emerge from the egg, don't even eat. They just go into diapause and spend the winter in diapause then have to come out and hope they're near a violet plant. <laughs> wow. You know, so that's, that's, you know, they're putting all their energy in just to, into numbers. And eggs, and again, if the moths get too abundant, um, parasites get to them. You know, and then parasites really. The Baltimore checker spot is a good good example. Um, that was pretty much the larvae. Uh, the parents would lay the eggs on turtle head, and the will go through the first two or three instars uh, in the summer and fall, eating turtle head. When they emerged in the spring, they'd eat turtle head, but they also could eat a wide variety of things, uh, honeysuckle, um, plantain, ash. Turns out all those plants have glycoid, uh, iridoid glycosides in them, but not as much as turtle head apparently has. Uh, somebody did an experiment that a uh, blue jay would throw up after eating two caterpillars that were feeding on turtle head, and it took caterpillars on a suckle before it would get an upset stomach. And the female turtle head is also kind of declining in the state. Um, and in the late 70s, early 80s, um, female Baltimore started laying eggs on plantain. One of the plants the larvae would eat because it had the glycosides. Now, how a female 
move that they would like sides and plantain is beyond me, but they would start laying eggs on plantain, which is a big weed in fields. And the butterflies just exploded. It went from something you rarely saw to um, Diane Bowers, Dean Bowers, who was doing the research on them, came down to a lot that I directed or near in Dartmouth, near the Lloyd Center, and about an acre-sized lot. She counted an estimated 200,000 larvae. And when the adults emerged, it was like a whole, they were flying about two or three feet above level. And it was just all this orange, like this going on above the field. It was absolutely freaky. And, but a couple of years later, the field was you know, being managed the same way, both the same way. The parasites had found them and the population just crashed and they're still there, but not in the numbers they used to be. Huh. That's interesting. I remember Baltimore checker spot being at my field site where I did my master's work and it was the only time I've ever seen them in numbers like that. Mm. There were just tons of them. And I wonder if it was something yep. similar. What was the year that that happened? That the first one it was, I've seen it was, uh, it was in 79. The ones that um, we saw in Dartmouth was 80. When did I start at the White Center? 86 was the year I started at the center. Yeah. Mine would have been like 2000, 2008, 2009, mm -hmm. maybe something different. But. Well, now they're, they're in uh, fields. If you want to see them, you go to fields that are not sprayed and have uh, a good amount of uh, planting. I mean, mm -hmm. they're still on turtle head. When I find there's a not decent population of turtle head, uh, uh, nearby, and yeah, they're on the turtle head there. Hmm. But the turtle head is so little that they practically you know, they don't defoliate everything, but they're defoliated plants. Hmm. Well, Mark, um, thank you so so much for sharing your wealth of information with us. I am very excited now to see what you find this year <laughs> in the preserve. I'm going to be waiting <laughs> with bated breath. <laughs> okay. Um, so and thank you at, so much. You're welcome. And I'm going to look at that one table uh, that had the numbers of affiliates where I had a number missing. I've got to go back and redo that table. I'll just send that to you. Oh, but that'd be great. I, okay. I, I don't thanks. know what happened to the numbers on that. I don't know if I jumped the line or what. But <laughs> you know, well, that missing number was like there's something, something wrong here. <laughs> so I'll go and fix that. Awesome. Well, thank you again so much, welcome. Mark. And thank you, everyone who joined us this evening. Thank you, Mark. You're welcome. Take care. All right. All right. I'll, I'll hope to see you this See you soon, season. probably. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not tonight, <laughs> though. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> Good night, everybody.